to the Hyperdome Library. First, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're on. Um, I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Some housekeeping matters before we start. Um, in case of an, of an emergency, there are two exits. One is the way that you came and one round the back. Um, for those of you with a mobile phones, I would appreciate if you could switch it off or put it onto silent mode. Uh, tea, coffee and light refreshments have been uh, provided there, so please help yourself. Also next to it, you'll see a whole, whole lot of um, Steve's books. You're more than welcome to borrow it out, so please um, choose which ones you would like. Um, event evaluation sheets have been provided for everyone on your seats. We do appreciate if you could um, fill it out, that way uh, we'll be able to improve our future events. Um, also, we'll be passing around a notebook whereby if you want, you can put your email addresses on it and you'll get first dibs um, for any other suitable events that may be coming up. As, you, as a lot of you know, this one was a booked out event and we had to turn back a lot of people, so this is a good way to get first dibs. If you're new to libraries, we do encourage you to join up. Membership is free and it opens up a whole world of opportunities. Um, so see, see one of my staff at the end of the event. Just to let everyone know, we have got a couple of, of future events that may be of interest. Uh, we've got a one called What Plant Where? So that's to be inspired by um, native plants in the local area. So there's going to be more uh, focus on this area. So if you're interested, that's on Saturday the 26th of August. Also another one is the World of Herbs by Noel Burdett. So he's going to be coming and talking all about herbs and everything. So if you're interested in growing herbs, this is one that you shouldn't miss. So that's on the 16th of <coughs> September and we're already taking bookings for these. And one that's happening close in a few weeks' time, um, in July, the 15th of July. Now, this one is only for the ladies. It's called Your Colors. So we're getting a stylist who, who will actually come and explain which colors suit everyone's complexion and clothing and that type of stuff. So it's with makeup and clothing. Um, now, the first event has already been booked out. We're doing a second one in the afternoon, um, and I think it's at 1 o'clock. So if you're interested, please book in early for that. That's almost halfway booked. So, it is now my great pleasure to introduce to you Steve Parrish, Order of Australia, photographer, writer, naturalist, educator, public speaker, and publisher. Steve has been uh, promoting the natural history of the Australian ecosystems and connecting people to nature for over 50 years. In the 1960s, he joined up as a young diver in the Australian Navy and teamed up with the New South Wales Underwater Research Group. Between 65 and 75, Steve pioneered underwater nature photography in Australia and published his first book in 1974. Also in 74, he became a wildlife photographer for the, for the Queensland National Parks. Since then, he has travelled all around Australia, photographing and documenting the various flora and fauna of this great continent. In 1985, Steve began his publishing house, for which most of us have gained hours of pleasure reading over his 2,500 published works. At 71, Steve still maintains a heavy field photography schedule working around Australia. His work has been published extensively in calendars, diaries, children's books, corporate gifts, and many other paper and digital products. Steve has over half a million images in his photo library. For Steve, inspiring others and watching them become involved with, with nature is his greatest reward. So please join me in welcoming Steve Parrish. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I think I'll put him on in the promotions department. What do you think? <laughs> uh, thank you, Darshan. I, I have to say that I'm extremely impressed with the organisation of this event. Pretty cool, eh? Yeah. And, and uh, I expected 30 to 40 people and uh, all these seats are full. And it's Saturday morning and it's um, sunny. <laughs> so, uh, wow, thanks for coming out. Who's, who doesn't live in the Logan Shire? Gold Coast, maybe? One. Sunshine Coast? Okay. I live at Mount Mellum, or have done for the last 18 months, uh, in the bush. Mount Mellum? You don't know where Mount Mellum is? Mount Mellum is actually the largest of the glass houses. It gets no credit. It's the big mountain up on the right. 
It's uh, steeped in Aboriginal culture and we have 10 acres in the middle of about a thousand other acres, so we're sort of lost in there. I actually work and live in a tin shed, but we'll tell you all about that uh, later on. Um, can we have the lights, please? Plunge us into darkness. I, I should explain my two friends. They're not photoshopped. They're actually bro quite insane brothers. And they were raised by uh, the uh, gentleman that runs the bird park on Kangaroo Island. Very, very unique bird park. Every one of the birds in his park is able to fly free and every one of them was raised from an egg. So these little fellas grew up in their own nest together and anything that protrudes they like to land on. <laughs> so it's kind of a cool pick, isn't it, uh, to kick it off. So um, uh, I'm v in many ways very fortunate. I've had, I've had the challenges in life that uh, uh, most people... I'm 72, by the way, add another year to that. Uh, lovely to see all the grey hair out there too, it's c cool. Um, I've had four wives, cancer, heart disease, uh, bankruptcy, flooded out, fought an insurance company for five years who wouldn't pay a cent. So I've had my dramas and throughout my life from my childhood I've uh, suffered fairly severe anxiety and depression. But one of the blessings that I've had in my life and I'm going to talk this morning about joy and blessings and fun and play and we need this in our lives don't we I mean I turned on the ABC on the way down here I actually have a regular 30 minute show uh, on the ABC Sunshine Coast and every time I drive over there I have the news on and I think oh now's my opportunity to talk joy and play and happiness because what I'm hearing on the radio nationally uh, is you know not exactly uplifting is it but when I was a young man, we had uh, presidents were being shot. We had communists under the bed, you might remember. So things haven't changed all that much, have they? But the joy that I've had in my life from the age of about nine is I became besotted with the faces of fish, of all things, as a little boy. I mean, I used to spear them, but I still love them. <laughs> I love them. Well, my family was very poor and we, I was a hunter and I, I shot rabbits for, for the table and I shot fish. But as uh, Augustus wrote in the great sculptor, said, love your calling with passion, it's the meaning of your life. So for me, the connection, connection to nature, not just animals but all, all by the way, the little audio visual I had uh, at the beginning, uh, that I've called Beyond Branches. I'm going down tomorrow. It's going to be announced in about a week. I'm the ambassador for Planet Ark's Tree Day. Uh, yes, it is well done. I'm thrilled. And so we're celebrating trees. So I've, I've got the, 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 the pleasure now of going back through my... It's actually 750,000 images. About half of them are digitised. And I can type in tree and all the trees pop up. I can type in tree, comma, arid and all the arid trees pop up. Uh, so it's absolutely wonderful to be able to now, at my, in my vintage years, express my passion for nature and to share it with people. Um, in uh, 2015, in fact it was over Christmas 2014, I was in a bit of a depressed state. Uh, mainly due to world of events, I'm very connected to what's happening all over the planet and I tend to feel... Uh, quite a, I, I tend to feel very passionately about things that are happening. I was watching an ABC program on ice and the effect ice was having on co the communities. I watched the documentary for 90 minutes. We had a Catholic priest, we had the chief of police, we had ex-pushers of vice that had been in prison and were recovering their lives and in the front row we had all the kids with the things in their ears and the tattoos and the, yeah, party man. Uh, and they were into using ice. And I listened to it intently for 90 minutes and I was, I was waiting for an outcome. I don't know whether you, you, you watch Q&A and you wait for an outcome. And I thought, what about reason for being? Alternate, alternate reasons for being. And I, became, I actually became quite angry about the fact that this is a topic that rarely ever gets talked about. Life purpose, reason for being, is a great healer. I believe it's connected to spousal abuse, drug addiction, alcoholism, 
depression, anxiety, all of the things that plague us as humans. And so I joined forces within a few months with Bush Heritage Australia, who are the largest privately driven uh, ecosystem conservation management organisation in Australia. And one of the reasons I, I wanted to be an ambassador for them, and I am, is that no one's ever heard of them. They're doing all this brilliant work silently, and I wanted to get out there and start promoting. And the management of uh, Bush Heritage really shared this philosophy and drive that I had to get the message of bringing life purpose, bringing a creative life on board can enhance your well-being, your mental well-being in so many different ways. And on the right, we joined up with the Mental Illness Fellowship run national organisation run by a very positive team of people. They use physical art as part of the process for healing. So that's just a little, if you like, a, 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 pre, a, a preamble of where we're going in this story. Uh. I took the story last year, interestingly, uh, we had Australia Now Festival in Brazil. And I'd never been to Brazil, in fact I'd only ever toured in the military West Coast, USA, China, Japan as a young sailor, 1920 to 29. And uh, of course when you're 29 you're not sure where your navel is. Uh, but to go over there as a more developed human, so to speak, don't take offence if you're under 29. Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't know where my navel was anyway. And uh, that scene that you're looking at there represents the entire population of Australia in one city. So 24.5 million people live in St Paulo. And since I've been back, I've never whinged about traffic. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> yeah, traffic, it is astounding. It's astounding traffic. And, uh, but enthusiastic, positive people. The average dwelling is 7,000, uh, uh, what is it, um, 75 square metres is the average flat that people live in. So we've got it so good in this country. I grew up in this little town, about over here somewhere, in a suburb called Norwood. In those days, Norwood was bodgies and widgies. Remember the bodgies and the widgies? Yeah. <laughs> From the motorbikes? <laughs> now it's the yuppies. Uh, and, uh, you know, a block of land is a million and a half dollars. So I grew, I grew up in that city and, of course, every young person that lived in Adelaide had one objective in life. Get out of Dodge. <laughs> OK. But it's actually com it's completely changed. I was down there for the uh, Arts Festival recently. There's a different sort of feel and a different sort of mood uh, about uh, Adelaide now. It's a very quiet... Uh, town compared with some of our more eastern states. But I was invited back uh, in 2006 to come to the, on a schools tour. And on that schools tour I was to talk to the children about how do you actually make a children's book? Where does the story come from? How do you pick the animal? Etc, uh, etc. Et so I picked my favourite, which is Toby goes to school. That, by the way, is the cutest of all of Australia's mammals, nominated by me. <laughs> uh, it's a five-month-old hairy-nosed wombat and a very soft, beautiful fur they have. So Toby goes to school and, of course, when I put that up on the screen, they all squeal. And, of course, the story of Toby is how the two children raised it. Now, Toby was found as a furless uh, little pinky. His mother had been run over. He was picked up by a driver coming across the Nullarbor Plain in South Australia, which is where they live now. And they wrapped it up in a hot water bottle because it was very cold weather and cooked it all the way to Adelaide. <laughs> the poor little thing nearly passed away from uh, overheating. Anyway, he finished up in Brisbane... Uh, here at, in, uh, in a, in a, a, at an organisation called Geckos, which takes animals to school. And the children are able to come into physical contact with those animals. Do you want to turn the lights off at the back? Is that possible? Is that glary for you people? No? Okay, so... We took 
Toby, this is Ben. So you can imagine show and tell at school, all the kids are bringing along this, this and that and whatever. And he walked in with a little basket with a blanket over Toby, plonked it out the front, and the, cat, the kids sat around and all of a sudden the blanket started moving <laughs> and out, packed, out poked this little nose. And so it reaffirmed again for me that real power that physical connection to native fauna can have. It's certainly my own personal story, which I'll share with you in a moment, but a very important uh, aspect of, of connection. So they asked me when I was down there, would I please put together a talk for the uh, teachers and the parents of the eight schools that I toured around, and we would have this event in the Adelaide Town Hall. Now, the Adelaide Town Hall was a 1,000 metres from where I grew up, so it was almost symbolic. And I said, what would you like me to talk about? Well, you left when you were 18, you joined the Navy, and now you've come back. Tell us what happened in between. So I sat down with my spreadsheet and I typed my life journey. Have you ever done that? No. What were the pivotal events that affected my life in a positive way for my entire career? And interestingly, on the left column was the name of a group of animals the kangaroos, the possums, the birds, etc. And on the right-hand side was another human being that actually opened the door. And I realised that all of the life pivotal events were as a direct result of the generosity of another. And I thought, what a wonderful story. You can see the book up there. We do have some left. There's not many. And by the way, it's 56 years now. So the book's going out of date. <laughs> but just sharing those stories of those lifetime connections. And of course it all starts here if you Google, I love Google, don't you love Google? I love Google. So if you type in children's art, this is what you get, page one. And I'm a huge fan of children's art, not enough, not enough of it goes on in our schools. But if you were to Google, if you're interested in creativity and in relation to young people, as I am passionately, is... Uh, the TED Talk by Ken Robinson, I highly recommend. I think it's up to 54 million now hits. And he's a professor of early, early childhood learning. Uh, and he talks very passionately about the importance of the creative arts, particularly dance and music, which tend to get left out, becoming part of the actual school curricula. And he's slaving away in the United States uh, on that particular subject. I think we're going to have to change our clicker. And of course, when I give talks, these are the sorts of pictures. But he tells, a, he tells a wonderful story that I'd love to share with you. It was a Catholic school. And the nun came up to Mary. And Mary was drawing uh, on, on, a, on, a, on a canvas a picture that looked like this. This is actually mine from my childhood. What on earth, Mary, are you drawing? And she said, I'm drawing God. And the nun looked down and said, well, you can't draw God because no one knows what God looks like. And she looked up with a very cocky, wry smile and said, well, if you hang around, miss, you soon will. I haven't finished. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that a wonderful story? So I was very fortunate. My mother was a, uh, a if, if you like, a victim of the, of the Second World War. We had our roof blown off husband disappeared into France. So she became very connected to Christian faith and became a Pentecostal preacher and very obsessed with this and felt that uh, to protect her children she needed to keep the devil out of the house. So no television, no books, no radio, although I did have a crystal set hidden under the bed. And remember everybody razzle dazzle and the white sports coat, remember that? Yeah, the top ten, or I think it might have been the top five in those days. So we used to crawl under the bed and feel very demonic listening to evil music. But I was left alone, very much alone to my own devices from a creative point of view. And of course, looking back at my age now, I say, thank you, mother. And of course, as Picasso said, we're all born artists and then we grow out of it. So that was my picture from uh, 58 and 59, 60 years ago. And this is more recent, so I haven't actually developed all that much, have I? <laughs> Uh, I'm very passionate about abstract art, I'm very passionate about play, I love bringing music into my life while I'm creating uh, and I've, I, you know, I can just switch off the whole world and go into this space. Who's into art? 
physical art. Yes, look at all those hands, fantastic. And of course in this day and age, that's an aerial photograph of Lake Eyre actually in its original form. The wonderful thing about uh, the digital platforms of today is that we can now play with our pictures to such an extent we can create absolutely anything. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. This is a workshop I ran. It's part of the Brisbane City Council's Lord Mayor uh, Young Environmental Photographer of the Year Award. They get fantastic cameras as prizes, etc. And all the runners-up and winners get a day out with me or an afternoon out with me. And I absolutely adore working with children. If, you're, if you've forgotten the art of play, just go out in the bush with the kids. Kids know about how to play. But have a look at that little picture in the bottom centre. That little girl there. So what do you think the smile's about? Why don't you run the camera? Mm -mm. I've been acknowledged. I've been recognised. Huh? Focus is on me. Very human. Of course, the entire social media platforms that people are making zillions of dollars about is entirely driven by the need for humans to be noticed. There's nothing bad about it. It's just who we are. We're hardwired to be noticed. I absolutely love that picture. And her mother come up to me, because all the mothers are lurking in the background. Her mother come up to me afterwards. Just, she said, just recognising my daughter is uh, a fantastic blessing. And can you recall your first connection with nature? Can you re record the moment that nature, if you like, came into your life and you recognised it? has been in very important to your own psychology, your own wellness. Can you remember a moment? Maybe last week. <laughs> um, you know, I can remember mine and I'm going to share it with you. And so I love to see, these days, I love to see parents in the bush. My father took me fishing once, so there was no physical contact between my parents, myself and nature. Fortunately for me, I was able to do it on my own, but it's terribly, terribly important and it doesn't take very much uh, to motivate that direction. My first connection, recognisable connection, with my uncle Harry was a missionary in India, southern India. And in those days we had leopards and tigers sneaking around the villages at night eating people and when you're seven, that's hot shit, <laughs> you know going to bed at night and thinking about the leopards and the tigers sneaking around and grabbing people and eating them is kind of exciting when you're this big. And he took me to the zoo because I'd never seen a big cat. And of course the zoo, the Adelaide Zoo in those days, concrete, bars, rusty old, but pretty awful. Uh, but very close to the edge of the cage, the lion opened its mouth and yawned and I smelt it. I smelt its breath. And it gave this sort of gurgling sound and it sort of permeated me and my art and my little statues and things that I used to play with became infested with lions. So I was hooked. So the big cats were the beginning of my original connection. At the same time my father was bringing National Geographic, remember beautiful National Geographic, well, still out there isn't it, coming into the home and after four weeks he used to let little Stephen, who was a bit of a vandal, tear the pages out and stick them on the wall. Remember we used to get the concertina pages? And I used to tear them out. And interestingly, I was tearing out the photographs of sharks and big fish and things that were underwater, which in those days were just being pioneered. At the same time, in Adelaide, we had a gun, a gun culture. Remember that, fellas, the 50s and 60s? Gun shop on every corner, no Australian Geographic, no bookshops. It was just simply guns. You know, Adelaide might have had 15 or 20 guns in the main gun shops in the major city area. And I became infatu infatuated with guns and hunting. In fact, uh, in 19, uh, 1961, I started an apprenticeship as a gunsmith, would you believe, in Sportco in South Australia. And of course, the, gun, the two gun factories, Sportco and Lithgow, now no longer exist, thank God. Uh, that ad is actually an ad from the year that I started my apprenticeship. I had 17 weapons by the age of 18. Now I've got... 21 cameras. <laughs> so, so while spearfishing, I was constantly losing my fish float to this fellow. Now, we didn't know what this fellow was. There were no fish books. Um, no one had been eaten at that point, so it hadn't been in the newspaper. 
but one got a sense of danger from this particular animal because of its girth, its size and that black staring eye and of course this is the white pointer. And on a school trip to the South Australian Museum I described this animal to the guide on the school trip and I just recounted this, recounted this story to the South Australian Museum people. I was over there judging the Australian uh, uh, photography competition they run recently. And uh, in fact, when you walk in the door, they've got a giant fiberglass cast of the white pointer shark, which is an icon for South Australia, of course. Magnificent animal. But as a direct result of that uh, conversation, I was actually invited to go on a tour with the what, what, are, what are known as the ichthyologists, they're the fish people, the people that study fish, with the South Australian Museum to Kangaroo Island. Now that little circuit of information uh, there was the beginning of a big change and of course the next year we started getting headlines, Rodney Fox was attacked, there was a young 19 year old surfer bitten in half and of course the newspapers loved all these lovely headlines. And of course it was uh, stay out of the ocean, beach closed. So the whole psychology, and by the way in those days very few people spearfished. And at that point one person was taking pictures underwater. In the whole of Australia. In the whole of Australia. So this gentleman that I'm going to meet, introduce you to in a moment is a pioneer. At the same time they encouraged me to read the works of Hans Hass. Anyone remember Hans Hass? who was interested in the behaviour of animals and it was this one book that also changed my life because I became interested in why animals did things. And of course Hans Hass, beautiful young man, he's now long passed away and this is his wife Lottie, became my first schoolboy hero. Not schoolboy, I wasn't at school but uh, young, as a young man he became my first hero. Uh, he went on to write a book, a very popular book called Man Watching. So he became a world authority on human ethology, human behaviour, uh, and did a big coffee table book called Man Watching which identified the silly things we do uh, with our bodies to communicate. So the, the whole story was coming together and this is me looking lean and sexy. One, one, of the lovely things, one of the lovely things about digging into the archives, you grey hairs know what I'm talking about, uh, is that you find these lovely pictures where you used to look gorgeous, remember that? Eh? No? Of course nowadays um, when the young people, I've got a 14 month old uh, grandson, very spunky little thing, he, he, I think a thousand pictures a week are taken of him and he's got a lockdown Facebook page I believe he's going to get the password when he's 21. Uh, but there you go, the, the, in those days very few pictures, we didn't do selfies. Uh, but I do love looking at them and seeing the lean shape, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I was 16 and uh, not many photographers could say this is the picture that was taken on the day I took my very first picture. First picture. And while underwater, Ego Oak on the left, he was a house painter about 15 years older than I, handed me his camera and pointed at a fish and indicated take a picture. I had my net and a little spear gun. I was collecting for the museum people, feeling very important that I'd been appointed as the primary collector of the animals. And uh, there it is, the first picture. <coughs> and what's more, it's in focus. <laughs> and two weeks later we had a reunion of everybody on the boat and he put it up on the screen and said, this is Steve Parrish's first picture. And for a young boy, by the way, I left school in grade seven. I didn't have an education, so I had rotten self-esteem. Uh, I was very, very shy. To have the audience clap. Again, acknowledgement, recognition, acceptance. So we went on and formed the Underwater, Re uh, Underwater Photographic Society of South Australia with a membership of two. <laughs> I think the membership is still two. Uh, but the, that, that then moved me in uh, at the age of 18 to join the Royal Australian Navy. I tried the army but I've got a very bung left eye that points in this direction. In fact, when I talk to school groups and I walk in and I look at this one, this one answers. <laughs> so I have to introduce the kids in the group to the idea of having cross eyes and of course when you do that they all turn their heads and look at the one or two in the class that have got cross eyes because when I was a little boy, uh, target for ridicule with the bung eye. But as I say to the kids it enables me to focus the camera and check out what's going on over there both at the same time. <laughs> so it is kind of handy. I uh, bought my first camera, the Nikonis one, the first amphibious camera 
ever released. And while we were in uh, Borneo, uh, Fiji, we used to go ashore and do some snorkelling and I started to take my first rather awful, out of focus, black and white pictures, serving on board HMAS Vendetta. Uh, I came back to Australia and joined, uh, started training as a ship attack diver. I think they call them Navy SEALs in the... In, the, well, in fact, the Australian Navy had clearance divers about five years before the Americans started developing their Navy SEALs. Again, looking very uh, sexy, don't you think? <laughs> Young and gorgeous. I, I like to be able to look at those sort of things and remind myself. While I was in Asia with my little Nikonis, uh, I, I actually bought a Hasselblad camera, my first reflex camera, and started doing cultural photographs and became very... In, very infatuated with street photography. Of course, in those days, I think there were three high-rise buildings in Hong Kong, and pointing a camera at people in the streets was a non-issue. Now it's a whole different space. And so these images are from the 64, 65 period. So I came back to Australia, still in black and white. I was fascinated with this darkroom concept of watching an image come up on a piece of blank paper. I absolutely loved that whole phase. Hasn't things changed? I'm putting a talk together at the moment called Dark Room to Drones. It's quite a long way, isn't it? We'll talk about drones at a later date, but I started shooting in black and white until one day I put in a roll of colour and out popped a coloured fish and that was the end of black and white. <laughs> it died immediately. And of course the museum who I'd started, I joined a small group in Sydney uh, and I, I met... Um, uh, a whole bunch of people that were very interested in collecting animals, photographing animals. And by the way, that same group now has a thousand members. I spoke at, at a conference with them last year. Uh, it's still very active. They've got a fantastic website. So it's been around for a very, very, very long time. So there's a lot of camaraderie going on. People are interested in underwater photography, interested in marine science, but connected to the Australian Museum. And so this was my first opportunity to connect with science and get science plugged into some sort of formal structure as, as to what I was doing. And so Dr John Paxton, uh, he's now in his 70, he's about 76 years old now, for, for 42 years was the curator of fishes uh, at the Australian Museum. He's still very active uh, with his work uh, at, the, at the museum as a, as a, as a part-timer. <laughs> But the way to get in with a scientist is to find out what they did their PhD on. That's, if you want to get into, into bed with a sci any, any scientist, find out their pet love and do all the research you possibly can so you can pronounce the words properly. And so I had to learn how to pronounce Clodopus gloria maris. It's, a, it's, it's, it's great as a password. <laughs> I've got Platycephalus bassinensis, which is a flathead. Chelmanops truncatus, which is a, a, a butterfly fish, so no one's going to hack me uh, <laughs> on Bassinensis. But this particular fish, it grows about this big and it's called a pineapple fish. And I found f four or five of them under a ledge in Sydney Harbour. And when I rang him up and said, I've found Cl Clydopus, and I tried to pronounce the name correctly, Gloria Maris, he said, oh, I don't think so because they're bathypelagic which means they live in very, very deep water. And I said, well, there's no, I don't think there'd be two fish that look like it. So anyway, uh, a couple of weeks later, we met on the back stairs of the museum. My little blue bucket, he remembers it to this day, lifted the lid and there they were swimming around inside. And my future was sealed. <laughs> <laughs> he brought me into the museum and introduced me to fish taxonomy, which is the classification of marine fish of which I've been interested in now for 45 years. Uh, and of course what he did his PhD on, I haven't told you yet, wasn't just the fish. I think we're going to have to get a new clicker. Uh, is the symbiotic bacteria on the lower lip of Clodopus gloria maris. So at a dinner party when somebody said what did you do your doctorate on, instead of saying rocket science or heart surgery or something really sexy, he could say that the symbiotic bacteria on the lower lip of Clydopus gloria maris, <laughs> which is great dinner conversation. Uh, in fact, uh, yeah, so there it is. Now that little, that little uh, symbiotic bacteria only exists 
on the lower lip of that particular species of fish. So his quest in life uh, was to find out how on earth it ever found the, the lower lip because as juveniles they don't have any. But what they do is they lift the membrane, create two little headlights and you can see them in the darkness swimming around using the headlights to, to find fish, uh, the shrimps, little shrimps they feed on. What's happening? Mm. <laughs> so about that same time I was drafted to Jervis Bay they were sending clearance divers to Vietnam which was not the best place to be and a dear friend of mine was actually killed by a bus bomb uh, in a children's toy the night he arrived and that really affected me emotionally and within a few weeks they'd formed this new branch which was helicopter based search and rescue and I thought well that's a lot safer than going up to a silly war so I was drafted to a place called Jervis Bay does anyone know Jervis Bay absolutely beautiful place and of course in those days even at Easter no one on the beach no boats by the way never heard the word whale never saw a whale they get 30,000 a year swim past Jervis Bay they come into Jervis Bay so there's an incredible change over time but I dived all these cliff, cliffs faces and in very deep water and my diving buddy was Jason Jason the White Labrador it became very famous actually the madman that dives in deep water with a white Labrador and he'd sit in the boat upstairs uh, looking after the boat while I was underwater. I, th I often thought that he used to see the bubbles coming up and he could always tell when I was ascending and he'd go ballistic. If I bought him a little aqualung he probably would have come down and joined me. Uh, and this is Jervis Bay, this is where we used to pull the boat in, this is Murray's Beach. We used to pull the boat in and do our decompression stop. So the, the water was 100, 100 feet, 120, 130, 140, you're probably in metres now. Uh, and the deepest I went down there was 170 feet. You're talking about giant Gorgonian corals, huge sponges, very, very spectacular, in many ways more spectacular than the coral, shallow, shallow coral reefs. But very short periods of time we were able to be down there. Uh, and of course the photography uh, in those days was pretty barbaric although we did, in, we did develop our underwater housings and this is a wide angle and a macro kit the housing was called Sea Tight and the brand wasn't really up to the, 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 the brand name because it leaked uh, you could get about two, two and a half hours underwater before the, you, know, you had to come up and empty the water out of it uh, but I set, up, set upon my first project what do you do with it? So the idea of having a project, so my project was to photograph every single marine fish that swam in Jervis Bay. Of course they didn't tell me that some did 900 miles an hour and that some of them lived under the sand and some of them were almost microscopic. But at, at, today there are 4,600 described species of fish. I got to 1,100 in my 40 years of underwater photography and these are some of them these images are back from 65 to 73 again if you're a photographer and you're investing in kit today and you see a future for yourself don't buy rubbish you know concentrate on full frame quality sensors and high quality uh, lenses forget about the brands and models just get the great sensor and the great lens and the images will last you a lifetime and of course many of these images uh, have lasted a lifetime and still in print today. So you know you look at those and you go wow I mean considering how old they are and of course single flash, deep water, dark water uh, so you get a lot of black background but you get some really weird fish. This little octopus turned out to be a brand new species known to science, it's only about this big, lives under the sand, comes out only at night and when they come out of the sand they're completely sand coloured you wouldn't even see, you can't even see them and the only reason it's flush pink is that my flash has gone off and I've agitated it so they flush pink and two seconds later under the sand he's gone uh, really quite remarkable and of course the beautiful uh, weedy sea dragon absolutely stunning animal and the, the giant Australian cuttle the giant Australian cattle grows about this big, 
when it's fully stretched out. And during the courting season, the males are very, very aggressive. And they don't like bubbles. They don't like anything that's reflective because they see it as a challenge. I've actually had one of them. You've seen the aliens, haven't you? Where it wrapped around its head. I've had that happen. Where this thing charged out of the dark and wrapped itself around my head. A little good on the old ticker, let me tell you. Uh, really quite remarkable animal. And about that same time, I was meeting... Um, I was broadening my horizons a bit. I'd been working with John Paxton in the fish area, collecting fish, photographing them, sending them up, because none of these people dived. None of them have seen the animals that they were passionately in love with, with their living colours, because when you m remove these animals from the ocean, they lose their... Uh, their texture, and of course, when you're talking about marine invertebrates, many of them, like anemones and so forth, they just turn into a hunk of junk. They just dissolve. They look like, uh, you know, nothing at all. So at about that time, I met my two invertebrate queens. The pictures aren't very good. There's very little now unknown about them. Of course, anyone into marine invertebrates uh, would know the names Isabel Bennett and Elizabeth Pope. This is the main... Elizabeth specialised in deep water uh, inver invertebrates and Isabel uh, specialised in intertidal invertebrates. So to actually have people that could say and give you information... Well, there were no books. It was some time before, in fact, Isabel Bennett created the first book, Fringe of the Sea. I don't know whether anyone's in uh, the, the library might have it. But to be able to see and read about the animals, the groups, the taxonomy, how these animals, you know, the difference between sponges and the difference between ascidians, et cetera, et cetera, for this boy was, you know, like <laughs> really exciting stuff. There wasn't any Google or books to re refer to these things. So we were totally dependent on the knowledge of others. And these two women came to my home and uh, encouraged me to start writing and taking notes. I bought my first typewriter. Uh, my grammar was shocking. In fact, my first book, Ocean of Life, I don't think about every third word's been corrected. I've still got the man manuscript. Uh, but just, just wrote it, let it pour out. And of course, what we have today is platforms that people feel embarrassed, you know, to, to, to express themselves with what will people think? If I put my poem up online, what will people say? How will they react? Of course, in those days, there wasn't anything like this. So in our naivety, we wrote, we took pictures, we put things together uh, without being terribly concerned about the opinion of others. And I went ahead and did my first book, Ocean of Life. Uh, it was reviewed in the Australian uh, newspaper because there were very few... In fact, it was the first book on temperate marine life. I thought it would be red hot and run out the door. I think I was sleeping on them for about eight years. Um, of course, no one, no one identified with anything. You know, unless you ha have an emotional connection... This is why koala cards sell so well and, you know, anything that people can identify... I've been to that locality, I've been to Uluru, I've been to the Three Sisters, so I'm identifying my own life experience and that's what draws me in. But with marine life, um, not much of a connection. Anyway, the, the reviewer said, the pictures are fabulous. I thought, oh, that's the tick. I can remember reading this review as clear as day and, but he went on to say... The text was a classic work in anthropomorphism. And I thought, anthropomorphism, is that good? <laughs> so I looked it up in the dictionary, and of course anthropomorphism is the assimilation of human emotion to animals. So I'd written the whole book as though these animals were in fact people living their lives. And of course the best-selling books today are anthropomorphic children's books. But that was the way I wrote, that's the way I felt, and that's the way I thought. Uh, and so I lost it, became embarrassed with what turned out to be, in my own mind, in my own mind story, a critical review and didn't write a word for four years. Aren't we silly? We, we, we all do this. Get a little knock and we all get hurt and we withdraw into our little uh, hermit shells. And of course today we've, we can buy underwater housings for any camera, we can buy flashlights, we can throw a switch and turn it into high definition television, uh, high, you know, uh, video, and the flashlights turn into movie lights. And we can do all this for a handful of thousands of dollars. 
for any, almost any make and model of camera available. And we can balance our flashlights with our daylight and get beautiful coloured gorgeous pictures uh, with some ease. And these are the sorts of images that now you see and there's some absolutely stunning underwater photography um, done in this country. In fact, I think the finest underwater photographer in the world lives at, uh, lives at Coffs Harbour and his name is Gary Bell. He's very, very shy. And if anyone's interested in underwater photography, oceanwideimages.com.au have a look at that uh, and you'll see some of the most spectacular underwater photography uh, and of course Gary is a specialist in that particular space. And these are some more of the many, many different animals that I've encountered uh, right through the sharks and of course here's our, here's our black eyed white pointer down here, uh, gorgeous, gorgeous animal. And of course a lot of those older pictures, some of them very old, uh, can be mixed with more modern pictures now because of the resolution and the quality. So again, if you're going to have a career in photography, start capturing good pictures at the front of your career because you will grow old, as we all do, and the years will go tick, 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 tick. I can't believe the, the years have gone. What happened? Uh, here you are, 72 years of age. But I, don't, I still feel 30. <laughs> well, almost. <laughs> and of course the photo libraries of the past uh, I still have one of these this has about half a million transparencies in it and of course there's about 300,000 photographs digital that are all catalogued digital, digitally so one can sit down in front of one's computer uh, when I do the workshops I show people how to do this the importance of doing it managing your collections so that you can get access anybody doing this sort of thing? yeah? Oh, seven hands, that's great. And so what I did as I started developing the program, I said, well, I want, I, want to, I, want to, I, I want to connect with people. What's the best way to do it? So I had a look at what the Australian tourist authorities in each state were doing, and I basically tea leaf their, uh, their maps because they're doing the marketing. For instance, if you were to go to Western Australia, they're marketing these regions in their websites and of course when you go to any one of these regions if you're touring you'll see them on the placemats, the banners, the posters, the postcards, you'll see these sorts of images from those regions and while people are experiencing those particular ecosystems and they find something they can take home with them that reminds them, this is pre-mobile phones everybody and of course the difference today in publishing is vastly different. In, 80, uh, in 75, I left the Royal Australian Navy, uh, trained to blow up ships in the dead of night. And I came to live in Sunnybank Hills, and I remember getting the newspaper out and thinking, what can I do with that blowing up ships and rescuing people from a helicopter? Where are the jobs? <laughs> There's no jobs. And so I tried bread vendor, um, truck driver, you know, give me a job, any job will do. My wife had triple certificate, I've had four by the way, the first wife, had triple, triple certificate nursing so she got a job on a phone call. And uh, it was about nine months later that someone said the Queensland Park Service is looking for a photographer. So I got very, very excited. And of course, when I went to the interview, they said, um, have you taken, we've seen your underwater photography, what about your terrestrial photography? And I have to admit here today, I lied. <laughs> because the weekend before, I'd run around the rainforest going click, 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 click. <laughs> so I had a few, at least some pictures, uh, of course, knew nothing about terrestrial ecosystems, like, for instance, rainforest, 10 o'clock on a sunny day in the middle of summer, not the best place to go and find wildlife. Uh, but anyway, I got the job and along with uh, a pioneer department uh, under, under Joe Bianchi Peterson was actually the Premier in those days, good old Joe. And uh, we had Ivan Gibbs as the Minister for the Environment. Ivan Gibbs was a covert greenie, okay? He wouldn't run around the National Party saying, I'm a greenie, I'm a greenie, I'm a greenie, but he believed intensely in environmental education and made sure the Queensland Park Service got some money for the education department, which 
in the history of all of the state by state uh, national park areas is pioneer. It lasted for seven years and then disappeared and no state government has education department any longer. Any educational work is freelanced out. We had a children's writer, we had a musician, we had a cartoonist. We had an incredible group of people. Um, and my first assignment was to go and find and photograph the logo which had been delivered by Michael Bryce, remember Bryce, the, the Governor General? Her husband was the designer and he designed the logo for the Queensland Park Service. So I had to take that logo with the proportion of a white belly and a black back into the rainforest with this gentleman, Dr John Winter, who'd spent 27 years looking at possums in the rainforest and was still admitting he didn't know a lot. Very humble man. Uh, and we went out and we spent nine nights driving around looking for the logo possum. And of course some of them are pure black, some of them have got little tiny white spots and the closest we came to with this, so this was 1975, uh, we finally got pictures of the Herbert River ringtail. 19 species of possums in Australia. They're called the Phalandrids. And of course my heart, I fell in love on that, in those nine years with Phalandrids. At the same time, the Park Service was working with the ABC who had a natural history film unit pre-David pre Attenborough. This is before Attenborough's Life on Earth series even was conceived and they started uh, doing a whole series on the National Park scientists, their work, and the need to conserve the environments they were working in, which was pretty exciting stuff for me as the photographer, very naive photographer, I might add. And so my connection with possums, um, your connections with possums mightn't be as favourable as mine. <laughs> you got noisy possums on the roof? No? I love the noise. You've just, just got to love it. Just think of these little people running around on your rooftop. In the roof. Now oh, that would be this fellow. This is the brush-tailed possum. And this is the rather rarely seen Tasmanian version of the brush-tailed possum. Brush-tailed possum is the most successful philandroid in the world because you only find them in Australia. And it's the cream possum. It's a rather odd colour. Scientists haven't been able to explain why a nocturnal animal would develop as bright golden, uh, which is a bit of a, a, a lure for predators. These little fellows here, my wife is a possum carer. I grew up with these little fellows running around the house. And when you've got a short-haired pointer and you're raising possums in your house, short-haired pointers, I don't know whether you know about them, but they can smell backwards at 90 miles an hour, uh, he'd wake up in the morning and pick up all these scent trails all over the house uh, and run around like a man dog possessed. And of course these uh, beautiful sugar gliders, anyone seen a sugar glider? Yeah? Sugar gliders, uh, you raise them, they tend to want to hang around. Uh, what, I mean, you, it's like your kids, you know, your kid, oh, we've just got rid of a daughter at 25. I mean, why would you leave? Food's free, accommodation's free, internet's free, <laughs> clothes are washed. <laughs> so uh, hang in there, baby, keep going. And so uh, you come into the kitchen at night, of course, and uh, you find your apples on the kitchen table being chomped away on, and they look up at you with absolutely no guilt at all. <laughs> like, oh, fair enough, and just go on, go on about their, their habit eating. We can't get the clicker going. Okay. And of course the science and photography, I was meeting people who were into turtles up there on the top left, uh, people doing small mammal research. This is how you do small mammal research for a locality. You put up a little fence trap and they trap these tiny little uh, uh, desiurids and little rodents out there in the desert and they get to be able to develop lists of the animals that exist in these places. <coughs> And more recently, uh, my friend Les Hall, we gave a talk at the Noosa, Noosa Library last Tuesday on the bats, the Chiropta of Australia. You all love bats, don't you? Yes, good on you. And here you see a little orange horseshoe bat uh, tinkering away up the top. And so the idea of working with scientists, particularly scientists that love to talk. So if I ever meet one that can't shut up, I thought, oh, he's my best friend. And they're great to travel with because they download, you know, 
many, many years of experience, they can download uh, that information. So the mammals of Australia, which by the way, 386 species, very unique in this country, uh, probably in publishing, in the general publishing that I've done, the most popular. And I think one of the reasons they're the most popular is that we, we as humans identify with the little round fuzzy face and the little black nose and... Is that working? Oh, God bless you. Uh, my f love affair with macropods, which is... It's really possums, macropods and fish. They're the three main ones for me. Uh, started with this particular individual. That's about a 14, 15 month old female wallaroo and they have the prettiest face big black round eyes uh, those lovely round ears don't you don't you think so yeah. and i was sent to south australia um, i was doing a book uh, on uh, australian wilderness and i wanted to get feral goats i wanted to get feral goats so i actually went there to photograph these fellows uh, at that particular time, the Gammon Ranges was overrun with feral goats, and feral goats are the most spectacular climbers and negotiators of cliff faces. And I'd sit in my little hide, hidden away down in the bottom of the gorge, near water, in the late afternoon, early morning, and watching the goats came down. And I watched this uh, incredible female wallaroo come down a vertical cliff face, da dong, 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 da dong. Like, you know, it would have taken me a month to climb that cliff face. And I just left a place called Mount Arapiles in Victoria, which is world famous for rock climbing. I'd seen all these nimble young men and women climbing this vertical rock face. And so I was pretty impressed with their ability. But when I met this fellow, and so I started uh, a love affair. I have lots of love affairs. I suppose four wives. You keep falling in love, don't you? Um, <laughs> I fell in love with these things and said I'm going to photograph and b become intimately knowledgeable about every macropod in Australia. There are 56 when we settled. We now have 50. There's an argument at 51. That's a DNA argument. So we've lost five <coughs> since we settled and that's half of them. So they are distributed. The, the, the most macropod... Uh, populated area is actually Kakadu National Park. There are seven species uh, near Nalangi, and there are more species near Nalangi than anywhere else in Australia. Generally speaking, one, two, or three. On my block, I have three. Um, and of course, in, in most areas, there's one or two at least. But there they are. There's some of the, the gorgeous animals the rock wallabies, the little fellas, the tree kangaroos. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. And of course the connection between humans and, uh, and wildlife has always interested me and macropods of course are extremely popular uh, in terms of uh, wildlife carers, et cetera, et cetera. When I toured Brazil, they love this. They all roared with, you know, they absolutely adore. By the way, Brazilians, red soil, blue skies and boxing kangaroos. They're the three. And they're all trying to get out here but they can't afford the airfare because the wages over there are pretty awful. Uh, but the, the best story I have for boxing kangaroos was one night I stayed in a farmhouse uh, and it was a generator-driven farmhouse, so at one o'clock in the morning when you want to go to the toilet, you know, where's the light switch? Well, you can't find it. So I stumbled outside, found the fence in the backyard, moonlit night, did what boys do, stood against the fence, looking up at the stars, relieving myself, and all of a sudden this big, hairy these two hairy arms wrapped themselves around me <laughs> and I was never told there was a fully grown red kangaroo in the backyard that had just discovered it was a boxer and anything at all, the dog, any visitor, it wanted to box it. And uh, so that was Douglas and then he started nibbling me down my spine and I put my hand around and there was this hairy rib, rib cage and I must admit I did have a little, a little skip. And so, yes, people don't realise that bringing these animals into your life. The petrogales are another group of animals that I adore, mainly because of their incredible agility and, and that they are the real survivors. The petrogales are nine species. These are the rock wallabies. 
um, in most circumstances, apart from one or two in Australia, one of them's on Magnetic Island where they're pretty tame around the landing area of the ferry, uh, the adorned rock wallaby and then the mariba rock wallaby, of course near mariba you can go and sit and have a picnic and watch, the, watch them hop around, but the rest of them are very, very, very shy. Uh, and there is still one that I haven't photographed and neither has anyone else. So if anyone's into finding the Cape York rock wallaby, which is very elusive. If you look at the manuals on uh, Australian uh, mammals, you'll find a, the skin of a dead one uh, is the only identification feature. This is my favourite. This is the bridal nail tail wallaby. It's uh, all but extinct. It's only found uh, sustainably on conservation lands. Um, the Australian Wildlife Conservancy has got the biggest population. There, are, there is a couple of small colonies, they release 25 and usually finish up with seven in a year left. Uh, and of course it's foxes, wild dogs and land clearing are the same three, uh, particularly in the state of Queensland which is uh, very vigilant in destroying the natural ecosystems. But we, we'll try not to get into that space this morning. And this is the bride and lyle toad, so it's, it's secretive, it's gentle, doesn't live in big mobs. Uh, not the smartest macropod, because when, when macropods group, you've got all those ears and eyes and noses. Usually if you take a photograph of a group of grey kangaroos, none of them are facing the same way. You get some looking this way, this way. So everybody's watching out for everybody. Something to learn there, don't you think? Uh, and of course this little joey sort of, why are we here? So lovely, lovely animal um, and of course the other uh, behavioural activity that is to their detriment is that when they're frightened they'd only run 100, 200 metres and they'll hide and of course if a fox or a wild dog or whatever is on its trail um, un under a thicket it's very, very easily accessed. Whereas something like a wallaroo will disappear into the rocky hills, red kangaroo will run for a day, you know, very difficult to track those animals down. And then to my favourite, 2006, I finally succumbed to uh, Les Hall's constant nagging at me for putting more bats in my books. <laughs> there are 83 species of bats in Australia. Seven of them are mega bats, the rest of them are micro bats. And you have met them. All of you have probably had barbecues with them and don't realise it because they're not moths flying around up there. They're micro bats, often. They can be moths, but the microbats are there because the moths are there. And so these little fellows. So just a brief introduction. My favourite is the spider-eating bat. The spider-eating bat. This bat can hover in front of a spider's web, protract its jaw, just like the little fellow in the alien, and snatch the spider off the web. And they particularly like... Um, uh, golden orb spiders, and there you can see him chomping away there. Isn't that a great piece of natural history? Uh, and then of course the, 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 the most gentle, the smallest and most gentle solitary bat, you won't get mobs of these hanging outside your bedroom windows squealing in the dead of night, is the northern blossom bat. And this one is from, the photograph was taken in Arnhem Land. And my favourite, the f false vampire, it's not actually a vampire bat. The vampire bat, by the way, is from Mexico, South America. We don't get it here. A uh, highly developed animal that's capable of draining blood from cattle or humans if they get in the way. Uh, and, of course, that's the, that's the bat that has driven the brand Stoker legends of bats eating you. Uh, this is the largest of our micro bats. It has a wingspan of about that. Big fellow. And they're budgie hunters, they love budgies. Um, and uh, I won't tell you how they do it, because it might put you off the bat. Uh, but, uh, budgies and frogs are particularly favoured by this fellow. And here you can see him living, th these, these bats, big colony in a, in a, mine, in a mine, gold mine site in the Northern Territory. It's an endangered species. Here's some more bats. Haven't they got great little faces? Uh, and every one of them has a different... This one's designed to bang into trees and grab things, so it's got cushioned lips. <laughs> this one's got highly developed sonar coming out of its nose. Absolutely incredible uh, agility and ability to 
to uh, predate. They'll fly up to several com kilometres into the sky with their young, teaching their young how to hunt for moths. They'll then return to the rookery with the, with the, with the I've seen them in southern, uh, southern Australia, 250,000 in one cave. And the children are given two to three weeks to exit the cave as skilled hunters. And if they don't, they fly off and leave them there and they perish. Wouldn't you like to do that with your teenagers? <laughs> I don't get out of bed. And this was under my house at Brookfield. This was a uh, very opportunistic carpet snake. We had a colony of bats in there and it was uh, hell-bent on grabbing them for dinner. The man that introduced me to the function of water birds, because water birds are another a big interest of mine, was a fellow by the name of Gavin Blackman and he did work on Brolga and their relationship with the vegetation and he specialised in doing a PhD and an ongoing scientific study right through Queensland but he, he was based actually in the Townsville Town Common. Anyone been to the Townsville Town Common? Unfortunately all the sedges have pretty much been gobbled up by feral plants and the greatest threat to the Australian environment is actually feral plants. Feral plants are breaking down ecosystems, uh, insect populations plunge and this has happened right across the top end into Kakadu so there's some pretty sad stories going on there and of course the world of birds who's, a, who's into birds yeah yeah look at all those hands and of course bird photography today 826 odd species of birds I say odd because it does go up and down one or two CSIRO's just released a brand new beautiful book on birds and we've just released one on the state of Queensland on birds that's got GPS and uh, reference for guide uh, localities etc and you can buy that online and of course the cameras that are available today enable you for instance something like this little uh, golden bower bird which is only this big and when it visits the bower it might only visit for one two or three seconds it'll weave its little flower or bring in a little bit of lichen and weave it in and it's gone so cameras with uh, very fast recycling, uh, cameras that can sync to electronic flashes uh, and, in, and in this particular case my friend here was lusting after my camera which was a uh, 200 to 1000 millimetre zoom. So I could, I could actually zoom in and out taking close ups uh, with very high resolution. That lens by the way is worth $14,000. So, so sorry to put you in, in a state of shock. However, there are lenses now available in the $1,200 to $2,000 to $3,000 bracket that are pretty damn good. And the only difference really between those lenses and this lens is that that's totally waterproof. So if you get rained on, uh, it's also capable of taking lots of extensions so you can actually multiply the extension length of the lens without detriment to the quality. So you do get a little bit more for your money. And we're able to now make beautiful images of birds, uh, whether they're doing their thing uh, or in very, very low light. And I think the technologies that have come in the last 2010, 2012, 13, around about then, you've got cameras now that will shoot extremely low light, 10,000 ISO, handheld 20th of a second, pin sharp, in a forest, no tripod, which well, 30, 40 years ago you would have said fantasy, fantasy. And now uh, we're able to get images um, much faster, much quicker uh, of these wonderful creatures doing their thing. This is the kit here and this is what's called a Jobu gimbal head which enables you to drive that camera with one finger. So you can move the big heavy camera, you can move it around, uh, changing the perspective ratio, horizontal, vertical, very, very easily. And you can set up with something similar to that for around about five or $6,000 and be getting excellent results. Second hand, of course, half the price. So you're able to get these lovely full-blown full in-action photographs freezing the action. Uh, we also have uh, focused tracking, tracking devices in the cameras. They're actually developed for sports photographers 
racing car photographers. And if we didn't have sports, we wouldn't have these cameras because there's not enough wildlife photographers out there to justify a company like Canon or Nikon or the others developing this equipment. So um, this was actually taken with the f one of the first digital cameras on my first digital trip. It was a, a crop sensor, and this was 2005. It's a Nikon crop sensor, taken with a fairly inferior zoom lens with a fairly inferior uh, converter. So while there are cheaper, less quality uh, equipment out there, if you're very careful with your captures and make sure you're getting your focus right, uh, using tripods, cable releases, taking your time, etc., you can still acquire quite good focus because, you know, this is, this is quite a sharp, lovely sharp image considering the uh, quality of the equipment. Um, <coughs> the world of reptiles and amphibians, I was first introduced to reptiles via this gentleman. Um, that's not a pistol, that's actually a punch. He actually punches a little uh, mark into the uh, carapace of the hatchling turtle uh, so that they, can, that, that they can follow that turtle, they, can, that they know which beach it was marked on. In fact, Colympus has the longest ongoing scientific field research program funded by the government, sorry, funded by you, uh, in, a, in Australian history. It's been going on for since 1974, still continuously. And uh, this was a trip to Rain Island, which is the biggest turtle rookery, one of the biggest in the world. And of course, he's an amphibian man as well, uh, introducing me at the same time to the world of frogs, 227 species of Australian frogs, uh, two of which are now extinct. I have pictures of both of them. The gastric brooding frog. It's not a pride, prideful thing to have a photograph of an extinct animal. Uh, we also have bats. We've had one bat in the last 12 months vanish. Uh, Christmas Island pipistrelle uh, has gone and there's an, also another one in Arnhem Land that they think has disappeared. So the world of frogs, which of course is a nocturnal world, so you go out with a headlight on your torch. There's a little headlight, very cheap, you can pick these up. Uh, I use the flashes that attach to the front of the camera. Uh, and of course while you're out playing with the frogs, you're getting little reptiles and you're getting insects, etc, etc. And most of my insect collection has been used in uh, the very popular children's books on insects. Very, very popular. And so when you've got a group of animals like insects, I think there's 4,000 fly species in Australia or some ridiculous number, you don't try and get all of them. The, the, the focus is to try and get all the something from each class. So you can talk about beetles, bugs, moths, butterflies and ants and so on. That's usually the approach of it. And of course 900, almost 1,000 species of reptile. Who's into reptiles? Yeah? Oh, seven hands, that's a bit poor. Maybe nine. Oh, that's a bit better. Uh, and of course these little fellow. How old do you think that is? One hour. So it's not, it's not coming out of the womb and having to be taught how to feed and walk and talk and all that stuff over a couple of years. It comes out really totally programmed. I'm a snake. Up on its back legs, <laughs> striking, using its organ for sensing. Uh, it actually bit me on the finger. You're only looking at the animal being this big. And of course when they're wriggly, uh, trying to get them in focus is a bit of a challenge. If anyone's interested in wildlife photography in that sort of space, in a couple of weeks' time we've got a Chermside, a wildlife photography workshop introduction, goes for five hours, and we actually bring in the animals. So you will go away with animal photographs. You'll find that on my website, we'll talk about that at the end. Wonderful, wonderful animals. So what I've done is grouped uh, all of my animals very, very simply. Spiders are spiders, you know, nothing fancy. Uh, nature, recreation, urban, social history. So it's very important if you're going to make photographs to actually build a story. So, you know, somebody, I was on the radio yesterday talking to a woman about her cr fascination for crayfish, freshwater crayfish. Make sure you get photos of the creek. Side on, head on, back on. You know, maybe, maybe the predator of the cray would be also nice. So you start to develop a little story around each particular animal and that's very important. 
and you can do that by following and developing your own style and approach. The most ex exciting project that I've ever worked on it was a book we did with the ABC called uh, Wild Habitats, A Natural History of Australian Ecosystems. Um, if you're interested in ecosystems, my f most visited web page, 146,000 in seven years, is, would you believe, a Google hit called Dry Sclerophyll Forest. And every day I get 30 to 40 hits on that page and I think, Dry Sclerophyll Forest, where's the magic? I'm not going to change it. <laughs> dry sclerophyll forest. Of course, dry sclerophyll forest is the bush. And so if you're interested, this is all free and I encourage kids to pinch the text and the pictures if they wish for projects. And you can have a look at uh, the, the various ecosystems right across Australia, written by a man, also Order of Australia, Alan Fox, who unfortunately left us two years ago, passed away, who was able to interpret science in a language of us mugs <laughs> so we can read it and understand it and fully appreciate it but if you're into Australian ecosystems go online go in go and buy wild habitat second hand you'll get that for I don't know 15 20 dollars it was 80 dollars the ABC printed 15,000 about seven years ago and they were out that they sold them in about two two years and then of course ABC publishing disappeared um, there's a beautiful map in it that introduces you to the various different ecosystems across Australia and these are the things that draw us in and get very excited about uh, those ecosystems. And just a few images from some of my favourite ecosystems, of course arid lands, the lowlands, the deserts and of course the desert uplands. Uh, the salt lakes, this is Lake Eyre in the 2010, beginning of the 2010 flooding uh, and this is more recently as of three weeks ago at a fantastic lake in Victoria called Lake Tyrrell. And it's the tourist hotspot of Victoria at the moment. There are thousands on, on social media. And it's been discovered by these people. They're called Chinese. <laughs> and would you believe these people will get on a plane in Beijing, they will fly to Melbourne, they will get on a bus, they will drive in that bus for five hours, they will get up at four in the morning, freezing cold, to get photos of each other standing on clouds. And then they get to plane home again. And I'm sort of going, oh. <laughs> really, really popular. But this is, this is the beauty of the lake. Look at that. And what's unique about this salt lake is that the substrate is unlike Lake Air, Lake Frome, like you know, many of the salt lakes where if you walk on them, you break the crust and your feet turn to mud. Very, very difficult to walk on. But for some reason, this lake would put on a pair of rubber wellies uh, if you get the water right and you get the clouds right. When we first arrived, there was no clouds, which makes it very unsexy. And then about an hour later, as the sun started coming up, we got this wonderful range of clouds. So there they all are. Um, I love watching tourists. They're, they're, they're particularly Asian tourists, they go around in bars, they get terribly excited about autumn colours, Brighton bathing boxes, they go nuts over. Uh, you'd think that back in uh, China there'd be more exciting things than Brighton bathing boxes. But there it is without any cloud, looking very sexy at sunset and sunrise. So woodland and heathland, temperate woodland, wallum heathlands. And of course we have tens of thousands of beautiful flowers where I'm about to go to Western Australia again in September. Last year we had a boom, wildflower boom. Uh, it usually starts around June in the north and as you come down, I'm talking Cal, uh, Shark Bay, as you move down th through Calbarry uh, into the southwest, as far south is into late October, early November, you'll get wildflowers still. Anybody explored that area? Yeah? Ten hands, good on you. And of course our flora is, if you're ever in Canberra, set aside a morning or an afternoon or several mornings and afternoons to go to the Australian Botanic Gardens, particularly in September and particularly after rain. Beautiful place with many flowers. Both of these flowers are from the Canberra Botanic Gardens. And so there's some of the colour and the beauty. Uh, and of course this is a very, be warned, a very addictive habit, uh, pastime, wildflower photography. And of course mountains and forests, we've got spectacular uh, mountains and forests right across Australia. 
I'm just speeding up a little bit because we're moving in on time. This is the Kimberley Coast. My favourite island, the Franklin Island, south of Cairns. It's a combination of continental and coral cay. Uh, quite a unique island. Accessible, is a national park. You can see the one figure on the beach. It's, that's cool, isn't it? Be the only figure on the beach. Uh, and of course the coral reefs and so on. Our lakes, the Pyman River in southwest Tasmania. Uh, again, the Pyman River. Kakadu's waterfalls. Arnhem Land left, Kakadu right. Alligator River. Uh, probably the most crocodile infested river. One of them in the world, actually. We counted 42 in two hours. And big fellas, too. Uh, Kakadu wetlands. Uh, taken with a $80,000 camera on a $2,000 charter. This picture was taken for free with a $3,000 drone. <laughs> now, there's no doubt that that photograph is sharper, even though on the screen you wouldn't tell the difference. Social media, you wouldn't tell the difference. A digital book, you wouldn't tell the difference. So when we do our workshops, we talk about what are we going to use our pictures for? Because 98% of them finish up on social sites or on the internet. And you don't need a very expensive camera uh, to do that sort of work. Um, mine is on order. It arrives in a week. My first drone. I'm not allowed to fly in a national park, which is unfortunate, uh, unless I'm surreptitious. Um, but uh, ab absolutely fabulous uh, for video and still photography. But for photographing habitats, phenomenal. And of course in those wetlands we have our wonderful uh, water birds. This is, this is Kakadu. And of course while in Kakadu on many of the trips that I've done I was first introduced in the early 80s to Aboriginal culture. Something that many white Australians unfortunately don't get an opportunity to meet. Traditional bush people uh, which um, really made a monumental difference to my life. The beautiful rock art. And the single animal that actually caused me to, I guess, pluck up the courage or the term determination or create the vision of leaving the park service and going out on my own was when I photographed this, <coughs> pardon me, pig-nosed turtle. And at uh, that particular time, it was recorded as extinct on the Australian mainland. And we were talking about it in an Aboriginal ranger training class with a group of Aboriginal people and one of them said, no, good tucker. Good tucker. Him good. Plenty out there. And so um, the scientists forgot to go and ask the locals. <laughs> uh, within five hours we had a pig-nosed turtle. And here he is, the first time ever photographed in Australia. Uh, this would have been 1984 and uh, they were taking it back for dinner. And I said to one of them, any chance of sort of delaying dinner? Because I'd like to photograph it in a little water hole somewhere and get an underwater picture. So yes, that's fine. So we turned up the next day and there were about nine land cruisers and they brought the entire community and everybody was sitting around watching this um, white man with a big white belly floating around in a water hole chasing a pig-nosed turtle. They thought that was hilarious. Anyway, I got a picture and got out of the water and waved the turtle goodbye because I thought, well, that's it, it'll be eaten, and uh, walked away and it was still there. No one touched it. I said, well, what's going on? I said, oh, no, you put him in a book, he'd be famous. Can't eat him if he's famous. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. You know, and honestly, the, the spirit, the knowledge, the ability to see things in the bush that you wouldn't even dream were there, going out with these young, mainly, there was a couple of women, mainly young Aboriginal males that were doing the Aboriginal Ranger training program. Um, and uh, it was just joy, the laughing, joking, connection with the environment, absolutely brilliant. And of course, the king of it all is a man by the name of Big Bill Naichi. He's now passed, he was about 60 when that photograph was taken. Uh, wanted his photograph in perpetuity. They've done books. He's a great philosopher. He is Mr Kakadu. He's, a, he's what's called a Gagadu man. In fact, the correct word for Kakadu is Gagadu, DJ, not Kaka. So it's Gagadu. And uh, his 
one of his poems. He was a poet. <coughs> and for those that can't see it, the back, I'll read it because this is the. So it was the, co the combination of finding an animal that was thought to be extinct, stories to be told, more stories to be told, uh, and this particular poem that caused me to get in a plane, fly back to Brisbane and resign. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go it alone. Sometimes when, we, when we, meet, we encounter pivotal points in our lives and we feel we need to make a decision, employment's wrong, relationship's wrong, something's wrong, sometimes you just got to jump. <laughs> and I remember resigning and standing on the street corner in Albert Street in town here thinking, what have I done? I actually like that job. But there was a future, a different direction. I feel it with my body, with my blood. Feeling all these trees, all this country. When this wind blow, you can feel it. Same for country, you can feel it. And this is the crunch. You can look, but it's the feeling that makes you. I always get emotional. So, God bless Bill. And so off I went, naively. Naivety is wonderful. Young people now today ask too many questions. How do I do this? What do I do? What do I do? Just do it. This is what you follow. Get the heart out there and go for it. Too much information. And also choosing counsel carefully. You know, collaborate with collaborators. Beware of negative talk. So I just went out there. There was nothing, no way of uh, knowing the future. And I was very fortunate that it was the beginning of the coffee table period. But what I took with me was what I'd learned at National Parks. And that was that ranting, raving, carrying on, the banners are important, chaining yourself to trees are important. It's all part of the story. But I sort of started to see that to get people identifying with nature, I had to try and provide a benefit. There had to be sort of some reason. If you're struggling on the Gold Coast with income and one of your kids is playing up and maybe your son's running with the wrong group and your husband's just been retrenched, and I'm asking you to care about rainforest. <laughs> you know, right now I've got too many burdens on my plate. But if, if rainforest is presented in a, in a way of bringing the joy of your own creative life adventure into the mix somehow, so that you actually see a benefit, a life benefit. Uh, I went to an ANZ, uh, I was invited to an ANZ bank uh, corporate function. They wanted me to bring some pictures, come in and meet the people. They all had suits and they were all mainly male. We had people from CIG, uh, gas. We had people from Adani. We had, you know, the enemy, so to speak. And they all had their little tags on and I had Steve Parrish, Nature Connect. And a shirt hanging out. And so one gentleman looked at my, Nature Connect, Green Party? I said, no, Nature Connect. What's Nature Connect? I said, well, sir, you're doing it as we speak. You're breathing. So Nature Connection for me is just simply the mental acceptance you're part of the natural process. That's it. There's no PhD, no trip to Kakadu, nothing to do with politics. I am part of nature because so many people on this planet and we know one with DT as initials, don't see themselves as part of the natural process. So they shut the door to it. Uh, education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. So we have on the left the Florentine forest, 100% clear field, 1,000 year old trees, net return, gross return to the, South, the Tasmanian government was $2 million. Where did the timber go? Pulp, what was the pulp used for? Barbie doll packaging. This is the Florentine forest, it's 2009. Same time Rudd was elected, same time we had the Tamar pulp mill issue and we were screaming and yelling about the Florentine forest imminent threat for clear felling. Uh, January the 14th they finished 100% clear fell, 100%. That's on our watch, on our watch. So education, um, joy, pleasure, purpose is my mantra. 
It's important we do have people that rant and rave, by the way, and go into Parliament and chain themselves to things. And I've been in Tasmania, I must admit, at three in the morning thinking, my military background for blowing things up. <laughs> <laughs> the thought does come. But uh, negative rage doesn't really achieve much. The other thing that's very important, I think, that to, have a, to bring creativity in your, into your life, regardless of age, on a permanent basis, is to have an objective, you know, a life purpose. So when I run my workshops, we start off with you know, the need to actually write down, make a commitment, get a key keynote or a PowerPoint, put something down there that makes a commitment. That's your hook that you can go back to. Uh, so when my publisher, who was a rugby publisher in Adelaide, went bankrupt in 1984, um, I remember writing this down. I want to inspire others to regard the natural world as essential for spiritual, mental and physical well-being. Just, just regard it. I mean, regard it. It's not, I'm not asking a lot, is it? I'm not asking for money. I'm not asking for anything. Just to regard it as essential to your process. Nothing to do with religion. Nothing to do with politics. But a life purpose that one can turn to on an ongoing basis. And so I was very fortunate that I was able to produce some books. Uh, just very briefly, we're running out of time. This is, the, this is the front cover of the River Murray book. And we promoted that book on the basis that this is the only front ja jacket of any book ever published that actually knocked the photographer out. <laughs> it was my first horse ride. That's not me on the horse. They gave me the horse, this horse to ride and I knew nothing about horses and um, we crossed the River Murray and there was a big bank and the stockman behind me yelled out, give it its head, <laughs> which is l loosen the reins. I had the reins and of course the horse with tight reins <laughs> threw me off. So I did a sum double somersault, knocked myself out and broke three ribs and that was about 20 minutes after my first horse ride. So while I love horses, uh, I'm not a big fan of riding them. And of course here we have young Christine Milne. So this was part of the early days uh, down there in Tasmania. And as a photojournalist I was f interviewing and photographing people doing the dam building and the logging as well as the greens at Greeny, Greeny Acres. Oh geez, that's wonderful. You're giving me a Kleenex tissue. Uh, retaining optimism. We know about retaining optimism uh, and keeping positive, of course, that's very important. So just toward closing, this is a photograph of an Aboriginal man losing a race. <laughs> this is the, one of the most monumental pictures of my career. Here he is losing the race by about 15 minutes. <laughs> so we had a racetrack that actually turned a corner and his horse wasn't into corners and it disappeared over the sand dune. And of course the wonderful thing is that he is exhibiting the language of a winner, even the horse looks excited, and not a soul out here is regarding that as a win. <laughs> so I really think that that's a great shot of optimism. And this is Kego, wonderful man. So coming back to Australia, uh, building a publishing company uh, with a team of people, I'm going to sit down because I want to move fairly quickly through these. A uh, team of people to help with the publishing. We had 125 people. We built a $15 million publishing business which thrived for 38 years, uh, promoting geology, geography, ecology, all the sciences, bringing groups of pictures together, using emotion uh, and science to promote connection, using cuteness wherever we could. This is Oscar. <laughs> I think I had 14 photographers with me at a photo workshop with Oscar. This was up in Townsville and I think there were about 2,000 pictures taken of Oscar that day. And this is the first day he left his mother. See what I mean? That's called, that's called manipulation. <laughs> a human connection, the human connection, it works a charm. So native animals, look at these two little fellas. And of course, smooching, <laughs> smooching. I think I had 20,000 likes on Facebook with that. That's a tree kangaroo that kept going to sleep. <laughs> and here he is sleeping, I'm going, ooh. 
and of course the wonderful books bringing uh, the excitement of children's books into, into their lives. And I, I always used to say to my sales reps, uh, if they can't read it, they're too young to read it, as long as they, they can always eat it. <laughs> and of course in 73, I'm sorry, 2000, uh, 2000, what was it, 2007, we had headlines. So I want you to remember next time you see the headlines, which you do every day, don't you? Instead of um, allowing the stories to build in your mind and enter a space that I call adversity. And in 2011, we were two metres of water through the warehouse, took out a million dollars worth of books, 150,000 images. And I love the Chinaman writing his... his um, fridge. I did pinch that off the internet so I give full credit to the mystery person that took it uh, and of course the flood uh, that came into our lives and the following month Book World Angus and Robinson Borders went bankrupt, remember that? Uh, took out another million and of course one year later there was the images. Uh, we had a hundred percent loss so I went from 40 years of building a publishing company with a net worth of 10 million to the physical ownership of $3,000. What about insurance? Insurance, 29 years of insurance at four grand a year, zero. Oh. Uh, because it was an inundation. I don't know whether any of you suffered from this. 28 suicides in South East Queensland, 11,000 bankruptcies. Who was uh, Let's not go there. <laughs> Let's not go there. Five years later, I'm the happiest man on earth. <laughs> you know. So uh, Eckhart Tolle w w was uh, the spiritual teacher who I had been following since 2007 when I discovered that my depression and anxiety was actually a story. <coughs> it was a story that I told myself for 45 years. It was a story in my head. And the interesting thing is that the mental health t people tell me that 85% uh, of people that report to their physician for anxiety and depression treatment are actually suffering from a well-told story. I don't know about you, 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm getting old, my mother doesn't love me. I mean, your mother doesn't love you at 71? She's been dead for 15 years and we're still carrying on about our childhood vision that mother didn't love me. You know what I mean? So when I identify with that idea that um, a lot of the stuff I was putting myself through was actually a story I told myself, it doesn't necessarily go away. But when I feel depressed, up comes the storyteller in front of me and I say, now you naughty boy. So the past and the present are usually where we go in our heads. You can lose something that you have, but you can't lose something that you are. And of course what I had was a creative life. I'd lost the physical and of course the company was pu purchased, reinstated, uh, within nine months I was back in action but didn't have 19 sales reps and 14 cars and a warehouse full of books and retailers that wouldn't pay their bills. <laughs> so life continues, uh, opening a door in another direction. So this is the message that I'm wanting to bring to people, that there's always another door. But if the story is stuck in your head, See it as a story. See it as you on a stage, you in the audience, the witnessing presence of the story. Reach out, pull the curtain. How, how do you pull the curtain at two o'clock in the morning? Take off all your clothes, particularly in the middle of winter, and run outside and let the cold air <laughs> snap you out. Make yourself a cup of coffee. Put on Leonard Cohen, whatever it is that turns you on, uh, and move on with your life. And so anxiety is a sustained emotion produced by a story that the mind has concocted it's a fear of something that has not happened, an attachment to some imagined negative outcome. Who's been there? Look at that. Identi right across Brazil, people identify with that, that space. And of course, Tasmanian devils have a punch up. They don't walk away saying, I'll get that bastard tomorrow. <laughs> it's over, right? How many people do you know that separated from their partner 15, 20 years ago and they're still going about it? Still going on about it. So these are the stories we carry. So by bringing art into my life and sharing art and motivating and encouraging others to 
come on board and create their own art digitally uh, in software with cameras. Uh, you, you are unique, you start to recognise yourself that you do have a creative voice. Every single one of you people have an immense creativity but you've got to give yourself permission. It's not important at all what this person thinks or that person thinks. Um, the ducks will always quack. Yep. <laughs> they will always quack. In fact, in my visitor's book, in my abstract exhibition, I had comments like, he's gone mental. <laughs> Thank you. That's a compliment. <laughs> uh, so there you go. We're all creative souls. And so we're looking at some uh, bringing joy and bringing joy into our lives, and we're looking at doing that with a series of talks, uh, talking to Bashan uh, for the library circuit here in Loken later in the year. So we're going to be bringing a whole range of these talks down to Logan. Um, at the talks you'll get session notes, digital notes that are linked to a website with great links. And so just in closing, I'm just going to share one remarkable story from my many thousands of joyous moments sharing online. If you got an email from Russia and it said, please send me your email address, what would you do? <laughs> Ring IT, wouldn't you? <coughs> I got an email from Russia and without thinking, I sent my email address. And I thought, hang on, what have I done? And uh, I thought, oh, well, we'll see what happens. Two days later, I started getting an email, aerial photograph of Uluru. Bit washy. Aerial photo of Sydney, aerial photo of the Gold Coast, aerial photo of the Great Barrier Reef. And uh, turned out it came from this gentleman, Reven, who was a Russian astronaut. And he'd use one of our maps to find his way around Australia in a Sputnik. see his hair floating up <laughs> and of course you can see the cameras nine Nikons and of course I said well I'd like to share this on social no you can't put it on social media I'll get into trouble with the KGB <laughs> I said will you do me an article photographing Australia from a Sputnik and uh, I never did get the article but he said I could st share the story in talks so there you go. Um, this is what it's all about. This little butterfly has eight, nine days from birth. We get 40, 50, 60, 70, maybe 80. What are you hoping for? <laughs> 90? <laughs> David Attenborough's up to 96. He's still directing films. So life is really, really, really short. And in that period, you've got to dare to fly, don't you? On that, thank you very much. So, anybody got, uh, we, we've got a bit of time, haven't we, Marwa? Yeah, we've got 15 to 20 minutes. And I th there might be a drink still there if you want to linger. Yep. Um, anybody got any comment, anything I'd like to share, any, um, any questions? Don't ask me which is the best camera. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Oh. Hello. Um, hi, thank you very much. It was it was wonderful, and I liked your finishing off with the spiritual, mental, and physical side of it. And it just reminded me of a comment that was made in a movie called Shrek. Aha, uh -huh, Shrek. <laughs> and yes. the wise philosopher said, "Yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. Today is the present. That's why it's called the present because it's a gift. So enjoy it." Present moment. Yeah, yeah. that's fantastic. Yep. Well, Eckhart Tolle's Power of Now is now, I think, the second best-selling spiritual teaching book in history. So people are really identifying. Nothing to do with religion and politics. You take that away and just look at the reality of life.
Anyone? No one? Yes. The wonderful microphone. Thank you very much for coming. It's been an honour to hear you speak. And um, I had a question. This may be too broad for now. How do you catalogue your photos? How do I catalogue? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, the way I teach and the way I catalogue are kind of a little bit different. Uh, I have about 50,000 images that are def definitively keyworded. So I can actually type in um, snow gum or... I use common language. I don't use taxon taxonomic terminology. A friend of mine uh, passed away a couple of years ago with tens of thousands of marine invertebrates and fishes, 100% scientifically tax tax taxonomic. Uh, and of course, if you don't understand taxonomy, so a flathead's a flathead rather than a platycephalus. You know, a platycephalid is the name of the group that represents flatheads. So yeah, just. Using common language, I worry about Latin only if it's in a scientific publication or an identification or a field guide. Latin names these days mean nothing to anyone other than those that want to search a little further. And because they date rapidly, like all the microbats have just been renamed, many of them, uh, then we don't use taxonomy until publication. So it's, it's common, common language, really. And Lightroom, which I, I do teach the, how to do that, is the catalogue system uh, in, in Lightroom. Basically a structure, you know, Queensland, South East Queensland, and then the identification of the regions. It doesn't hurt to get a regional map, council map, uh, something you want to put borders around. Uh, and, of course, if you uh, have a quest to be commercial with your work, you're better off having an intense collection from... a confined region. So if you wanted to be commercial and went, say, Tweed to Noosa and west to Toowoomba and you documented lifestyle and flora, fauna, la la, and developed a reputation for having a very comprehensive, accessible library in that space, you'd probably do better than if you went 35 years national. Most library collections that are online, you know, a lot of photographers are disheartened because there's so many uh, libraries now, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 dollars. They're very gentle libraries. They don't go deep. The resolution of the images is fairly shallow, so they're not they're not high resolution necessarily. Uh, and um, you know, like, for instance, if you Google Sydney, you might get the Opera House, the Bridge, um, Manly, uh, Bondi, etc. But you won't get Hyde Park, and you won't get the cultural. You won't get the, necessarily the the festivals, uh, or also those smaller iconic elements. So that's the way it's catalogued, yeah. Thank you. Can I ask, how, how do you put, you know, like professional photographers, no, I don't mean, they, they have some sort of a digital signature on their photographs? Mm -hmm. uh, without being smart, you Google how to, you'd Google the question. Um, the good news is that absolutely everything is online and can be Googled. The only problem <coughs> that I've identified is that people don't necessarily know what to Google. <coughs> There's also the issue of can I trust who's teaching me. When we do our workshop notes, I've identified four of the best world teachers for advanced Photoshop, beginner, inter intermediate, advanced Photoshop, Lightroom, Topaz, which is an art, art software, uh, so there are people that are highly qualified as teachers. <clears throat> One of the best photographic teachers in Australia is here in Brisbane for anyone who's a beginner. He's a fellow I actually do, do workshops with and we're doing the wildlife photography workshop together. His name's Dean Holland and it's Take Better Photos. You can remember that. <clears throat> his, master, his master skill is a PhD in methods of teaching. So he understands the language to use and the simplicity and the best way to structure uh, a message or, 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 or a teaching program. He's, he's actually taught me a lot of how to teach because um, just because you're good at doing something doesn't mean you're good at teaching it. Two different things altogether. But I highly recommend his workshops for anyone who's a beginner or struggling, wanting to get into Lightroom at the very bottom end. I teach Lightroom more intermediate and advanced. He does it with the beginners. 
Uh, he's put over 16,000 people through his workshops and I've seen people that have never held a camera in their lives walk away in four hours feeling quite confident. Uh, it's Take Better Photos. His name is Dean Holland, but Take Better Photos. Uh, pretty reasonably priced courses. We're running a whole program from November, December into next year up at uh, Mary Cancross Centre. It's 90% uh, over, overviewed by the Sunshine Coast Council, actually. And we're doing bird photography, macro photography, a whole range of different uh, workshops if you're interested in coming up spending a day or a weekend in that awful place of the Sunshine Coast. <laughs> so it's 10 minutes from where I live, so if you're interested in coming up. And I'm also running one-on-ones and one-on-twos at home for people that want to get into really advanced learning. Um, and they bring their own computer, they bring their own equipment. Uh, yeah, Nature Connect, uh, which is this website here, So if you just typed in Steve Parrish Nature Connect, you can remember that, and you go to events. Not a lot in there at the moment, uh, but there's a whole lot about to go in for later in the year. And the other, the other great advantage of doing uh, workshops and programs is that you get an opportunity to meet people of like mind, and we're going to, we're going to be doing retreats to places like O'Reilly's uh, and others where we, where we can stay in one place for four or five days uh, and do a lot of fun stuff. But meeting people that are in your space, that you can develop a relationship with. A lot of people I meet on workshops, I just did one in Melbourne on fine art, which was pretty advanced, and one of the women in that uh, middle-aged woman said, I'd love to go more into nature, but I'm, I feel a bit fearful. You know, I'd like to go with someone who's uh, more comfortable. So uh, one of the girls put a hand up and says, let's do it, and we'll do it together. So camaraderie is really terrific if you can... Anyone else? No? Well, thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Darwin. So